let's talk about more population ecology. The predator-prey cycle shows that the prey is the species with the higher numbers. And this is because the predators eat the prey. And so there has to be more of them. If there was less of them in this example, if the pyramid instead was inverted and there was more predators than prey, then the predators would eat all the prey. And so the prey would be dead and then all the predators would die too. So that cannot happen. There must be more prey than predators most of the time. To avoid being prey, pre prey have various defense mechanisms like camouflage, mimicry, toxins, and structural adaptations. Camouflage means to hide. It's adaptation in form, shape, or behavior like the snowshoe hare, which is white in the winter and blends in with its surroundings, or frogs, which are darking top to blend in with leaves and light underneath. So if seen from underneath, they blend in with the sky behind them. This octopus changes shape, color, and texture to blend in with the algae that it is attached to. Some more examples are the ptarmigan, the common barren caterpillar, this flounder, and this lizard. Mimicry is when an organism takes on coloring, shape, or behavior that will provide it with an advantage. It is copying something else that is already protected because of its structural adaptations. This is a drone fly that looks a lot like a bee, but it is not a bee, but it's protected from predators because it appears to be a bee. Some more examples, stick bug looks like a stick and so predators don't see it. Leaf bug looks like a leaf. This mimic octopus takes on the shape and behavior of a flounder a lionfish, and a sea snake. And by doing this, it's protected from its predators. The monarch butterfly is born first, and the monarch caterpillars eat milkweeds, which makes them and the adult butterfly toxic and unpalatable to predators. The viscerae butterflies are physically similar to the monarch butterflies, which reduces their predation rate too. The moth has eye spots on its wings to mimic the eyes of an owl. Eye spots are used to scare off potential predators by making the insect appear to be part of a much larger organism. Toxins are bitter tasting chemicals that deter predators. Usually if a frog is toxic, it's also brightly colored to warn its predators that it is poisonous. Structural adaptations include porcupines and cacti made to ward off again predators. Producers. Plants are called producers because they make their own food from sunlight through photosynthesis. Consumers are animals. This is because they cannot make their own food, so they need to consume or eat plants and or animals. Relationships between a plant and an organism that feeds on the plant are often classified as producer-consumer relationships. However, that type of relationship could also be classified as one of parasitism. For example, if a grazer, like a cow, consumes the leaves of a plant but not the roots, the plant does not die because it regenerates from its roots. Because the plant lives, this relationship could be classified as a parasitic relationship in addition to producer-consumer relationship. Okay, so we just said that a cow could be considered a parasite. A relationship could also be classified as one of predation if an organism were to consume all parts of the plant, leaving the plant with no means of reproduction and leading to its death. So if we think back to that same hapless cow, possibly it pulled the plants out by the root and killed them. So now we can refer to that cow as a predator. Competition between species for various things uh, can happen between different species, so interspecific competition is between members of two different species. The more similar the niches or jobs of a species, the greater the competition. Remember, the niche is the role that an organism takes on in an environment. Intraspecific competition is between members of the same species, and we can remember because of the A. Competition can be for food, space, mates, oxygen, water, or sunlight. Symbiotic relationships between organisms. Uh, there are three types. Mutualism is where both benefit, and so we write a plus sign for both organisms. 
Some examples of this are cleaner wrasses on whale sharks, E. coli and humans. E. coli lives in our large intestine and makes vitamin K for us, and we provide it with a nice warm place to live with lots of nutrients. Bees and flowers. So mutualism, two organisms are living together. They both benefit like lichen. It's fungus and algae working together to digest rock and turn it to soil. Clownfish and anemones. The movements of the clownfish informs the anemone of its identity, so the anemone does not sting it. If the clownfish is stung, it's protected by its thick mucus. In return for the anemone's protection, the fish brings scraps to it, keeps it free from parasites, and scares away large predators like the butterfly fish. This is a picture of the cleaner wrasse and the whale shark. So the cleaner wrasse removes dead skin and parasites, and they are protected from their predators. Bees, of course, pollinate flowers, and they also get nectar from the flower. The oxpecker bird feeds on the parasites on the animals. So the oxpecker benefits because it eats the parasites, and the animals benefit because the parasites are removed from them. Parasitism is where one organism benefits and the other is harmed. So we write a negative sign for the organism that is harmed. Parasites get nutrients from the host and do not usually kill the host. Parasites can include mosquitoes, lice, mites, roundworms, and tapeworms. Hosts can be both animals and plants. So one species benefits and the other is harmed. The parasite receives nourishment from the host. Parasites don't usually kill hosts. So a variety of worms living in organisms are considered parasites. Uh, this Caribbean soldier fish is host to the parasitic isopod attached to its head. Lymphatic filariasis or elephantiasis. The disease is caused by parasitic worms uh, transmitted by mosquitoes. So it is living in the lymph and blocks the way for lymph to get back up into the circulatory system. So this is before treatment and after treatment to kill the worms. Commensalism. One species obtains food or shelter from another species. It does not harm or help the other species. So we write a zero for the species that is not affected by this relationship. An um, example includes shark and remora, buffalo and birds, burrowing owls, and prairie dogs. So the shark and remora, the remora gets a free ride, and the shark is not affected by the relationship. Uh, shellfish and barnacles. Barnacles living on anything, unless there's way too many of them, they don't take nutrients from the host, and so the host is not harmed at all. Buffalo and birds, if the birds are just hanging out on the buffalo and not eating parasites, then it's only the bird that is benefiting. The buffalo is not affected. Burrowing owls um, take over the burrows left behind by prairie dogs. So prairie dogs have already moved on. The burrowing owls move in, and so prairie dogs are not affected by this relationship. The burrowing owls are benefited. Ecological succession is a gradual process of community replacement. It's the progression through these three communities, pioneer, then seral stages, and finally a climax community. The pioneer communities are the first species to invade an area. It can be a hardy plant, algae or moss that can withstand a hostile environment. The seral stages are the organisms that grow after the initial stage is in place, so grass, shrub, or small trees. And then finally, the climax communities are most stable because they have the most biodiversity. So there's two types of succession. Primary begins with bare rock after a glacier recedes or a volcano erupts. The pioneer species invade, in this case it is lichens, followed by grasses, shrubs, trees, and finally the climax community. In secondary succession, it occurs after destruction of a climax community, for example, a fire or flood. It does not start with bare rock, soil is already present. So the pioneer species that invade would be grasses or weeds. Then more grasses can grow, shrubs and trees, and finally climax community is reached. 
Let's compare primary, primary and secondary succession. Primary begins with no life, whereas secondary follows removal of existing biota, so living things. Primary has no soil. Secondary has soil, so S for soil. Primary is in a new area, like a volcanic island. Secondary is in an old area following a brush fire. Primary succession, the lichen and moss come first. In secondary succession, seeds and roots are already present. In primary succession, there's low biomass. Secondary succession, there's higher biomass. Both of these progress through binary community, serial stages, and finally a climax community. This is showing primary successions. We have receding glacier. This was Angel Glacier in Jasper National Park in the early 1900s. Here it is in 2005. You can see it's receded quite a bit. And then 2020. So this is near the point, and this one's moving even further back. And it's receding due to increasing temperatures. Here we have primary succession, begins with bare rock, and then pioneer species invade. So is this primary six or secondary? We have bare rock left or after the retreat of a glacier. So this is primary succession. Here we have pioneer species. The annual plants grow and are succeeded by grasses and perennials. Because we have soil present, this is secondary. Here we have starting with bare rock and then lichens. So this is primary succession. Fires are necessary in forests because debris is cleared away, the ash fertilizes the soil, and heat is often necessary for seed release. So there's two types of pine cones. This type releases seeds each year, and this one only releases seeds after fire opens the pine cone. 